And a wonderful hello to everyone. Joel and Jared here, obviously presenting our first quarter update for 2024. Um, we're coming from Singapore, and it's so great to be back in the region after a nice Easter break. And I hope that everyone tuning in has had a great Easter and managed to have a couple of days off. I know Australia gets an extra public holiday to Singapore. I somehow duped myself out of a public holiday's work, but either way, we're, I'm enjoying my time here in Singapore. Um, to provide a, give us a brief update um, for what's happening in the markets for the first quarter of 2024. Um, there's no there's no doubt that the markets have done a lot of heavy lifting actually in the past three months. We're seeing most major markets rising as much as you know 35%, um, which is really wonderful to see. We'll see how this carries on throughout the rest of the year. This is obviously in contrast to some of the Magnificent Seven suffering some slower share prices. Um, but then we've got our market darlings like NVIDIA as high as or as up as high as 80%. So this is um, yeah, really optimistic. The, the small caps index with um, Vanguard uh, have, have stated that they're up 6% already for this year. So that's already a good start to the year. Um, but let's go um, take a look more broadly about what's happening in the other regions. I'll throw over to you, Jared. Thanks, John. So as John mentioned, uh, we have seen a very positive start to the year, uh, particularly driven by the US, uh, the Eurozone, and of course, Japan, which for the first time in as long as we can remember, finally actually has inflation and is starting to lift interest rates. So very interesting times for the Japanese economy, but more on that a little bit later. If we start with the United States, obviously it's election year. Uh, we're probably hearing far too much noise than what we would prefer there, but Economically, everything looking quite good. Um, the labour market has been relatively strong. We've seen an increase in participation rates in the United States. Uh, we've seen a lot of pre-retiree workers going back into the workforce. So more and more workers going back. Now, that is also potentially a sign of financial stress, particularly in lower socioeconomic uh, regions and markets in the United States. But nonetheless, a fairly positive thing for the United States labour market. Uh, we have also seen inflation fall off a cliff in the United States. Um, there was some uncertainty early on that inflation in the US would fall slower than Australia because the US, particularly housing market, are largely on 25, 30 year fixed rate mortgages at ones, twos and three percents. Wouldn't that be nice? Does not exist in Australia, obviously. Um, so naturally, that just results when you have rising interest rates in more people don't sell. But the big difference in the United States is they have different tax frameworks when it comes to fuel prices. So as the oil prices come off, we have seen inflation drop quite dramatically in the United States. Uh, looking at corporate earnings at the top end of town, as Joel said, the small caps are starting to increase, which is great. Uh, and we think that will continue, particularly as the interest rates start to come off. Uh, but at the top end of town, we have seen uh, quite strong corporate earnings. And if we look at most analyst reports, most are expecting about a 10% uplift uh, in earnings over the next 12 months. Uh, the majority of larger companies did a great job at hoarding a lot more cash throughout COVID while rates were cheap. So everyone's kind of built up a bit of a defense mechanism against these high rates that we are seeing at the moment. Uh, consumer confidence is very much at new highs. We've seen the S&P 500, the NASDAQ reach new records. As Joel touched on earlier, you know, Tesla down 35%, NVIDIA up 78%. It's a wild ride in the United States, certainly in some stocks. Uh, but for us, we do remain quite bullish on uh, sectors like cybersecurity, like healthcare, um, and of course, uh, technology, but as technology expands into different sectors. So sectors like agriculture, health tech, uh, even financial technology going forward. So. What we do think it, uh, it will be a fairly positive year ahead, uh, even though there is an election that will just lead to more noise. But usually an election year means no major surprises when it comes to uh, geopolitics uh, and, of course, monetary policy. So watch this space, but we think it'll be a fairly good year for the United States.
Looking at the Eurozone, it has certainly been a lot more lacklustre than the United States. They don't have the Magnificent Seven, the tech giants, to really occupy the headlines. So it's been more of a slow and steady uh, sort of approach in the European equity markets. Uh, we have seen inflation drop uh, radically fast, which has been uh, far quicker than a lot of people expected. Um, obviously, all eyes on the European Central Bank as to when they will cut rates. But given inflation in a lot of the countries in the region was up 6, 7, 8, 9 percent, we're now back closer to the 2 percent target. So chances are they will be able to cut rates, not necessarily aggressively and not necessarily in the short term, but potentially by as early as the beginning of the second half of this year. So potentially from July, August, we may start to see cuts uh, in the Eurozone. The UK, we're far less optimistic about um, the sort of flow and effects and the fallout of Brexit is still playing out with the data. The political scene is arguably the worst it's been for some time. Um, the current opposition looks to be in front in the polls, but again, take the polls with a pinch of salt. It's not necessarily a reflection of what's to come. But what we are seeing are tax cuts for the uh, with the current party to try and maintain power. At the same time, interest rates going up. So you've kind of got these competing forces. <clears throat> how, how all of that's going to play out? Uh, I think time will tell, but not a market we'd be looking to throw an awful lot of money in at this point, um, and potentially more changes when it comes to property tax um, and other taxes in the United Kingdom. So as I said, watch this space, but uh, not a market we're hugely bullish on at the moment. Now, looking a little closer to home at the markets in Asia, obviously China tends to occupy a lot of the headlines as it has done over uh, well, the past few years, to be honest, but particularly this year, uh, China's one of, the, one of the very few major markets that has no inflation. So when China reopened, when they lifted all of the COVID restrictions, the commonly held expectation was that all of the Chinese consumers would be out spending money again. That hasn't happened. Their inflation rate is zero. Their GDP growth is okay. But the CCP, the current government, the current leadership, is still very much expecting that they are going to hit their 5% annualized GDP target, which is going to mean that there are going there is going to need to be more meaningful policy changes or more, uh, more meaningful policies introduced to really stimulate that domestic demand. So what does all of this translate to? Well, a, a bit of cautious optimism, in our opinion. Uh, China and Hong Kong equity markets are back at 2009 levels. So what an awful 15 years that would have been if you just bought uh, either market or that had been the large exposure within your portfolio. It also doesn't mean that it's going to bounce back tomorrow uh, because what that's going to take is more confidence in the CCP, more international investors seeing less risk in the current leadership in China, forcing companies to delist overseas. And of course, then you know groups like UK pension fund managers, US fund managers, starting to really boost their Chinese exposure. Uh, so I think watch this space. I think we will see more and more meaningful policy changes. Um, with a bit of luck, we'd also see uh, China's trade relationships improving, particularly with Australia, selfishly, because if they can start to export more deflation, given that they don't have any inflation, then that would obviously lead other countries' uh, inflation rates to drop, which would therefore mean that other countries can actually cut interest rates that a little bit faster and hey, wouldn't that be nice? Not just for those of us with a mortgage, trying to repay some debt, but even just for the Australian dollar as an expat, uh, and of course, just for interest rates gradually coming down, which would naturally have a positive impact on both property and equity prices, uh, both in Australia and globally. So a bit of an update on what's happening in China. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, Japan is back in the headlines again. We are finally starting to see inflation. They have made some changes to their uh, stock exchange rules. We've seen more and more buybacks. We're seeing stronger return on equity figures uh, in Japan. Japanese economy is looking relatively strong. You could argue that it's more on the expensive side now, given the, the rally we have seen in Japan uh, since 2023. The yen does look quite attractive, but again, we're not expecting a huge appreciation in the yen until other countries really start to, uh, to slash their interest rates. So that would take the Federal Reserve to come out and start cutting rates. And that may then lead to the yen to start to appreciate because Japan, well, they cannot cut rates. They can really only go in one direction, 
or do absolutely nothing. So again, watch this space. May mean it's a good time for a holiday. May mean it's time to look at investments in Japan. Uh, but as we said, a bit of cautious optimism in the region, um, but certainly watch this space. So Joel, I'll throw back to you to talk us through what's going on back home in Australia. Now, a little bit closer to home in Australia, what we've seen particularly over the last quarter to 12 months is a really strong immigration number coming into Australia. Now, that has really helped fuel some of them labour shortages that we had in our labour market, particularly as a flow on effect from COVID. This, the immigration caps are set to look to be decreased going forward, and this is largely driven on the back of a housing supply shortage. If you're living in Australia, or I'm sure you've read the news or trying to rent in Australia, it's very tight. It's, it's nearly borderline impossible to get rental properties. In most of our major capital cities, the vacancy rate sits below 1%. Now, when we're talking about markets and um, rental vacancy rates, anything less than 3% is, is essentially a very tight market. It's, uh, we've got a severe housing shortage, probably going to be good for housing prices going forward, but broadly speaking, to, um, to try and get into the market for essentially those first homeowner and first home buyer groups and renters, it's going to continue to have an upward pressure on pricing, particularly in rents and um, homeowner prices. In addition to that, when we're starting to look at the broader macro um, details, as Jared said, if the Fed Reserve in the US start to um, decrease rates, that could be looking good for the Aussie dollar and we might start to see some strength return to the Aussie dollar. So I suppose there's a broad piece of information for our non-resident um, clients. This could be opportune time to really consider where your currency exposure sits. Um, do we continue as we're rolling in towards the end of financial year? This might be ideal times to look at things like superannuation contributions, um, prepaying interest on home loans, ways to maximise our Aussie dollar exposure or where we can um, derive a benefit. So that sort of summarises up Australia. We still see plenty of quality in the market in Australia. So there's lots of areas where we are still challenging and we're being quite bullish on. Healthcare being one of them, um, data, Aussie tech is still quite attractive for that sort of long-term growth prospects. So plenty there, to, plenty there and plenty of options to consider. So that sort of wraps up our um, first quarter um, video. So thank you so much for tuning in. Um, please give us a follow on all social medias. We do have some exciting updates coming through with the launch of a podcast. So watch out for our um, highlights there. Thank you so much for tuning in. And if you, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to either of us. Thank you very much.